Well, welcome to the first live Flong Party. I'm Glenn Fleischman. I'm a technology journalist and a print history researcher, uh, recovering typesetter, many other things, and uh, the creator of the Tiny Type Museum and Time Capsule Project. And uh, with me today are Elizabeth Savage, Dennis Duncan, Paul W. Nash, and Sarah Werner. And we're all going to be showing you examples of Flong from our various uh, collections and travels. Uh, but I thought I should start with explaining to this audience some of you will be, I'm sure, experienced uh, print people, and others may uh, have never heard of Flong, uh, even if you've been printing for uh, you know, 40 years, because it's kind of an, an outdated technology. And uh, what Flong is, uh, oh, and I want to thank Elizabeth Savage before we start, too, for suggesting a Flong party, which is a hoot. And uh, everyone in my household is very excited about it. They hear me talk about Flong too much to them, so they're excited. I have another group of people who want to talk about Flong. So... Uh, Flong is, uh, occupies a unique part of printing history because it's a sort of a literal glue between page elements made of metal and wood and a printing press. Before Flongs, nearly all printing was done directly from metal and wood type and metal and wood engravings, and this wore down the type and it could ruin illustrations. So it kind of limited the lifespan of your material, and it also had physical properties that made it difficult if you're printing always from metal or wood you can't do certain things like curve a plate and use rounded presses. Uh, so what if printers could make a non-destructive casting from this original metal and wood and then somehow print from that? Well, that's what a flong is. It's from the French flan. Flongs are, uh, that are in the, this form became popular starting in about the 1830s or so using a sort of uh, papier mache manner, a mixture of blotter and tissue paper uh, interleaved with glue and proprietary mixtures that were often unique to each shop uh, and uh, beaten into a form to be printed. This is uh, the this image I love is beating the flong. It's a flong brush and a guy there is very patiently just beating the, the flong on top into the metal form below. It would then be baked in place on the form to, so it would become a solid. It would be removed and then a printer would cast a metal plate from it called a stereotype, which would then be what was actually printed from. Uh, here are a couple kinds of ways of making flongs. So I showed you the flong brush in the previous slide, and here's a matrix rolling machine. Uh, they're also often called matrices, like word, another word for mold, of course. Uh, flong is kind of the older term, but in modern printing, it's always a matrix or a mat. And uh, you could use a, a, press, a press like that that rolled it through. There's someone um, uh, batting out and cleaning a flong on the right, uh, the New York Times, the 1940s. And... Uh, uh, I don't know that we have any early flongs among all the people here or in any collection of these uh, pre uh, sort of modern era flongs uh, because around the 20th century, turn of the 20th century, a dry flong material that was made of a wood pulp became the only sensible way to produce these molds in a streamlined process. And uh, by the 1940s, the, the head of uh, advertising production standards at the New York Times uh, wrote in a book that a plate could be sent from or sorry, a page could be sent from the composing room. It'd be sent down through kind of a dumbwaiter arrangement to the stereo room, made into a flong, cast into a metal plate, put on press, and printed in a finished newspaper 15 minutes end to end. That's how efficient this process came, kind of at its peak. Uh, and you could cast flongs in uh, left is a flat plate casting device. If you're casting a flat flong for certain kinds of presses or purposes at right is a casting box for curved plates, which I will show you the result of in a second. And here's like a single unit casting device. Um, it's from Paul Aiken's Platten Press Museum in Zion, Illinois, where he has every single thing that was forgotten in press history is, is in Paul's museum, including this, which is to cast uh, small flongs that are used for advertising or comic strips or so forth, so they could be laid out into a full page of a newspaper. And then this is what the result would be like. Here's a, a New York Times. This is a wartime newspaper production uh, from the uh, Works Product uh, Works uh, Progress Administration photo set. And uh, there's someone uh, finishing a, a stereotype. It's a half cylinder that would go on press, and it was cast from that flong. Uh, and I have a little movie to show even. Um, I'm not gonna show the whole thing, but this is from the Chicago Tribune in 1931. And it shows, uh, I'm just gonna zoom through it. And it shows a page, you know, kind of a rough uh, magic of photography thing here with the page being uh, laid out in uh, with photo magic here. And then it goes to the most wonderful thing, which is it goes to uh, 
a flong press. Let's see if I get it right here. So here's this fellow, he's beating uh, the flong in place and he's running it through, um, he's putting you know, these layers on to protect the type, even in that scenario, so it doesn't get crushed this process. It's going through this roller to put the flong uh, deep into the grooves. And then it goes into another flat press. I haven't seen this two-stage two process elsewhere. He puts some felt or other arrangement on top and then uh, puts it into, uh, yeah, you see, drags it over there, puts that into a much heavier press that has kind of a platen on it. Then you can see steam coming out. So there's some kind of pressure is producing, uh, it's helping to dry it in the process, or it's a steam press. Then he pulls it out and you can see he just pulls the flong right off there. And that's the sheet. And then I'm just gonna zoom ahead here. So that's the flong that he just made from a full page. And then it gets sent off to this operation, this casting machine gets put in in this curved shape and they pour metal in. And then, you know, literally in seconds, it comes out because the lead uh, cools so quickly and they grab the thing and they pull it off and they get it off for processing and uh, it gets put on, a, it gets numbered and put in a line to go off to the press room. And then it goes, gets locked onto a press and uh, gets printed. You know, this is just minutes of operation. They're all numbered, put in place and there you go. And then that's the operation. So that's the, uh, that's the brief look at Flong, <laughs> the history of Flong. And uh, I'll come back to our screen there. So I was like, quick pass through <laughs> for those who don't know it. Uh, and uh, we each have stuff to share. And so I guess I would ask who wants to share first and I'll, I'll then I'll introduce you. I'll give you your formal introduction and then we'll go from there. Looks like Duncan, is that what you'd like to go first? Yeah, could, could, could I share first? I think you're, uh, you're muted right now, I think. Oh, am, am I on, can you hear me? Yeah, let me, inter I'll, I'll do a quick, I'll do an introduction, which is Duncan, uh, Dennis Duncan is a lecturer in English literature at UCL in London. He's the author of Index, comma, A History of the, and you can find him on Twitter at DJB Duncan. That's DJ, be like boy, Duncan. And, uh, and go right ahead. And I'm going to move to my other position here while you do that. Well, I, I wanted if I could share first, because I've got loads of questions. I, I'm a total flong uh, ingenue. And what you just showed um, looks very much like my flong um, and or my flongs. Um, but I was wondering if, if uh, uh, you, you or other people on the panel might be able to fill in the gaps. So I have recently acquired three flongs from the Times, the London Times from 1982, which I think, Glenn, you, you uh, sort of said is, is, is towards the end of the sort of golden age of flong. These are late flongs. Um, they're all from the front page of the Times, Saturday, March 27th, 1982. I'll show you one. Oh, 1982. Two, yeah. Interesting. Three, and they're all the same front page, which, which leads me to, to one question, which I'll ask in a second. One thing that's interesting about them is the front page changes. So at some point during the process, the headline uh, has flipped from Israel accuses seven mayors of being PLO agents. Uh, people probably can't see that. Uh, these two say that, but uh, on this one here, the top story, because Israel has moved down to second item here, and the top story is white lorax on Rome, concern over Pope's visit. I actually looked up the Times Digital Archive to see which is the, uh, the version they have. Let me share my screen here. Um, ba -ba -ba -bum. I'll tell you one trick is uh, while you're sharing that is uh, look for the number of stars or dots in the um, date line of the front page uh, oh. that typically indicates the edition and some newspapers used to produce uh, it could be as many as five editions a day. Oh, wow. Okay. So if it's if but not now in America, they would use uh, I think the New York Times use stars. Oh, Sarah, you're gonna and, and feel free. Everyone should feel free to unmute themselves as they want to. Not too many of us. Um, I'm going to um, have. I'm going to disappear for a second, but keep keep going. I've got a. Uh... So welcome. Can I just quickly ask something that may be relevant to the yeah. stars? Um, I've seen. That, I've noticed that a number of flongs that are available now, and suddenly this seems like eBay has been flooded with them, um, are either advertising for routine kinds of things, mid-century, or they're front pages of newspapers. And I wondered if there's a commemorative function. Was there something? Um, particularly important on that day. Um, I know that there are a number of flongs for the day that man landed on the moon, for example. Um, and so, 
Mm. So I, I've never seen songs for any newspaper except for the front page. Yeah. And they generally tend to be commemorative of an event, either a, a news story or a change within the, uh, the making of the paper. So the last um, hot metal printing of the Times so or the Guardian, for example, or the I day that somebody boring. retired. <clears throat> yeah, I, I definitely. Boring interior page. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, when we get to when we get to mine, that's what I have. And I think it's a commemorative flog. Like, I think it was specifically made oh, to yeah. um, mark this incredibly story that the Washington Post broke um, about Nixon's resignation. <laughs> so I'll show you. But I, but I do, because that's what I wondered, too, about this idea of sort of striking it not to use, but as a to mark an event, sort of. But I definitely agree. It's interesting. I've only ever seen the front pages or advertisements. I've not seen or comics like Glenn has. I've not seen like interior pages, which doesn't make as much sense. Well, I guess it does. This also, I should take this opportunity to introduce everybody else because I realized I was, I, we're not doing a strict go around. So uh, Sarah Werner was just talking. She's a book historian, a Shakespearean digital media, media scholar, and the author of Studying Early Printed Books 1450 to 1800, which is on the bookshelf you can see there. I do not yet have your index index book, Dennis, but I am sure it'll be added there soon. Uh, Elizabeth Savage is a flong aficionado, senior lecturer in book history and communications at the Institute of English Studies, the author of Early Color Printing, German Renaissance Woodcuts at the British Museum, which you will also see behind me. And Paul W. Nash is a bibliographer, librarian, and printing historian, and an amateur printer, and is currently editor of the Journal of the Printing Historical Society. Uh, everyone's Twitter handle is in the YouTube video, so you should be able to find that in the description. So I just want to make sure everyone knows who all these fine people are. And, uh, got my complicated. I was going to show this is the most boring piece of flong. It's just an average inside page. Um, I have a bunch of these actually, and some of them I, I know it's going to sound shocking to historians. I cut up some flong for the Tiny Type Museum, making sure that it had nothing of interest about it except that it was flong, like some crummy. I shouldn't say crummy, but like um, not perfect condition inside advertising pages and things like that, that had no historic value and of which I knew there were multiples and multiples I've kept. So um, this I have not touched because it's kind of a, a beautiful condition interior page, but I was going to point out, <clears throat> this is from a 19, uh, this is 1947 page is the, um, let's see if I can do this right. If you see on, there we go. So you see there is a, there are two stars there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Edition. And I hadn't looked at it before. And usually, depending on the newspaper, it will sometimes be on every page. Um, but it's a, it's a definitely a convention that um, uh, it was so, I mean, that's the funny part. Like we think of the modern era as being so efficient, but the era of flongs that New York Times sat about where they could turn a page from the composing room to being basically on the street in 30 minutes end to end. It was like 15 minutes to get it on to pr off the press, another 15 minutes to get it to Times Square in New York and have bundles thrown out for people to read. 30 minutes end to end, it's incredible. So they would produce, the New York Times would easily produce five editions a day and smaller papers wouldn't need to do that. Um, but that's one way to track. <clears throat> so I'm sorry, so, Paul, uh, so uh, Dennis, you were showing, um, so you had three different versions of the same Front page. Yeah, that's right. And and another question that sort of led me to is is how many would there be? I mean, how many presses would if there's a million copies of the Times uh, are being produced overnight? Um, how, how many flongs do we need to 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 get? Uh, um, how, how many things on how many presses? It's yeah. I mean, it depended on the size of the paper, but they might be. I mean, this is the other advantage of a flong. Like a flong is a kind of photocopy, right? It's a um, it's an intermediary. I mean, it's more like a mimeograph, really, <laughs> at some level, because of the quality and other issues. But uh, my understanding is that uh, they would sometimes, I mean, you could have multiple uh, presses running the same thing simultaneously. And especially, mm -hmm. I mean, for the larger newspapers, they might actually have an extensive plant where they were running the same pages. For some editions, they'd be running different pages and uh, uh, interleaving them like folding them together gathering them at the end and in other cases they might be able to uh, print like the sunday edition is a good example the new york times would print uh, over the course of a week would print the entire sunday paper and uh, and this is in later years so i don't know if this is pre or post flong but they would print the entire edition all the entertainment and other stuff that was fixed for the week and then they might change the front page out a bunch of times so 
because that edition was so huge, I'm assuming they had to use their presses. They wouldn't be printing uh, the entire paper again, or just even one section. They might be printing across multiple units of presses, the same thing at the same time. And then things go bad. A plate gets broken or it wears down. They only use the plates for a certain number of impressions. I mean, a fairly large number, uh, but they might, uh, I was told that flongs weren't reusable in those kinds of scenarios. Once it was cast, the flong was thrown away because it would have been ruined in the process. I don't think that's entirely true. I think sometimes mm. uh, the material would come off well enough that it wasn't an issue and the flongs were put aside, but it's un it doesn't seem like they were really intended to be reused. So um, uh, they could make multiple of the same flong or they could find a flaw and have to remake the flong. But it's surprising there'd be so many good copies preserved like that if it wasn't some incredible yeah. event. There's a comment on YouTube from Beef Chicken Industries. Uh, would a flong be sourced from the molten metal? I know the temperature of a linotype pot is checked by how quickly it, it um, searches a piece of newsprint. Um, well, Paul question. might, I don't want to put you on the spot, but Paul might have some things to say. He's uh, yeah. been leading the way with some recreations of dabbing, so kind of oh, like yeah, flongs, yeah. but using metal. Um, and I wonder, Paul, if you had any experience with that or... Make any comments? Uh, and if yes, not, ignore me. Well, yes, indeed. In fact, I was uh, I'll be talking about my own flong making activities, and I was I'm showing one that I did scorch by having the metal too hot. You can see the burn down the down the face of the flong there. So you do have to get the metal at the right temperature, and if you get it, it's really quite a delicate operation to get the metal at the temperature you want. Um, and it, uh, this was an example where it was too hot, and you can you can see the obvious results, and that made that flong unusable. Yeah, hold hold that closer. To the, oh, you're sorry. Let me see if I'll, I can. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is these whole systems, you had entire industries built up to perfect that temperature, right? To perfect the process so that it was perfectly streamlined. You know, I do often compare it to a photocopy machine because the process was so repeatable and so boring. That's why I think there's so little of it that survived is it's as exciting as an old photocopy, right? It's not a, to the people in the mm. industry. Yes. Um, in a way, it's much more like a mimeograph um stencil because it was it was something behind the actual print um which was reusable and repeatable but as you say it was considered to be very boring it was a utilitarian thing and once it was created and used it was usually discarded and there's just just as as an aside i mean we're focused on the flong party but we could on a different day have like a mimeo party a um mimeo party. and right and Aaron Schreiner McGuire, who's the executive director of the Bibliographical Society of America, has given talks and has, has made really interesting points about um, the print history effect of discarding all of those Mimeo stencils. She works specifically on, um, she really spends a lot of time with screenplays. And so you get these early stencils because they make it and then they make changes and then they just get discarded. So we've lost this sort of chunk of, of history, uh, which is one of the things I find really sort of curious about flong is what it when it's surviving and what type of flong survives yeah. and what condition it's in um because dentists looked like they were dentists do they look like they were used i don't know how you would tell that but i mean do they look because mine does not they, they really do i, I was just going to show when paul showed the school oh interesting now we have uh uh one which oh, is i haven't seen anything like that all the ones that i've collected have been almost pristine like they're clearly made and put aside or someone yeah. pulled them out of the process but then you have some in color don't you that show different colors of ink being used a bit like oh yeah that looks all silver the process uh-huh left a mark yeah. on the um yeah, oh, so I, those I, were actually pulled from a, a interesting machine. that's amazing okay that's so cool, Dennis. Wait, so where did, so do you know, do you have any sort of like provenance? Not to be librarian about it, but do you know the provenance of your? <laughs> I don't, it just, it came up at a rare bookshop uh, um, and I was like, oh, I've always wanted some flong. And so, <laughs> uh, so, so cool. that was, it was a uh, um, uh, sort of chance purchase. To have three of the same page, is just, uh, it's just super it's cool. Wild. Yeah, Things, amazing. With and changed and and very much you can see you know different qualities. It's uh, they've all been used. They've left sort of scorch marks or lead marks on on either the whole flong or parts of it. Um, I thought that was really interesting what you were saying, uh, uh, Glenn, about that they're, they're sort of one flong for for one plate. Um, makes me think. They must. I mean, for for, for the, the the major national newspaper in this country, the Times, they must they must be making quite a few of these to get just the number of oh. newspapers you need. 
um, running over. Yeah, they would paper. be producing thousands a night for a, a big paper during the heyday, you know, in the 70s or 80s when papers were, I mean, it's what's funny, if you look at a newspaper today, part of what the flong preserves, I'll grab this again, is, you know, these are, uh, I don't know if you can see the scale next to me. I mean, this is a, you know, these are the size of this page. Yeah. So huge compared to a modern newspaper. This is a 19, this is the 19, uh, what is this 80 or 71 page. And it's just, you know, I can, can't put it in screen. And this is even slightly larger from 1947. And, uh, they'd be producing just thousands a night. And then again, something would go wrong or there'd be an addition change, they'd catch a typo. Um, I mean, they're fixing typos mid run in newspapers because they were producing so many of them that made financial sense and they would just pull one off. Um, Which yeah, is so, partly so, why you see, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna say, well, you've, you've pulled, I think you were the one who pointed this out to me. And sometimes you find these incredible, because Flong was so, um, Pro proliferous is that a word proliferating there was so much flog there was a lot of flog guys um people would reuse it and there's like people would there was some story about some couple and they were sort of like remodeling their house oh, and they were yeah, sort of like opening yeah. up the walls and it turns out it was like insulated with flog yeah, you find that in I the u.s right? apparently yeah, yeah. like it's yeah. amazing yeah. right so it was US. like that kind of you know like how you like use with newspapers to insulate your walls they were just using flog can i speak just, about the the quantity yeah. of flog that we've lost by the way, I love your idea about the Mimeo party and lost artifacts and print party. I'd love to have a frisket sheet party at some point. Um, but this box is, um, I don't know if you can, oh, it doesn't show up as a face. Oh, hold on. It disappears into your back. I think you have to hold it in front of your shirt. <laughs> um, one second, let me blur yeah, it. If you hold it exactly in front of you, it might. That's right. Oh no, that blurs it too. Um, oh, that's hilarious. Okay, it's, one second. If you back it up towards video. you, that's so funny. Oh, there, oh, there we go. Got it. Oh, it says dry wood oh. mats. So in England, they were called um, mattresses, mats. And I, I don't know in the US if that was used, but this is dry wood mats. And it says, uh, for those who can, um, uh, for those who can afford the finest, you can hear how hard it is. It's a wood mat. The paper ones are flexible. And on the inside, uh, can you read that on screen? It's 1950 to celebrate oh, yeah, the, the 200 million production ah. 200 millionth dry wood wow. flong from the dry wood flong corporation and on top of that um i was er, let me pull this out of the thing um uh, i have this photo of the dry wood flong uh, company factory <laughs> uh which was That's in so um who's it oh my god it's York. huge mm -hmm. yeah, and so yeah. wood flongs were produced on a number of locations including fairly remote ones and you see it's right by a water source um, and has its own water tower. So there is a lot of flung that has been missing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's probably, you know, some like thousandth of a percent of all flung, maybe even a ten thousandth remains out there. And a lot of it's just, it's in random places. You know, it's just, um, it shows up, as you say, it shows up at eBay all the time and people don't know what it is. Occasionally I'll write someone and say, oh, this is flung. I'll just say, you're advertising it wrong. I want you to sell this. It's called flung. I'm like, oh, thank you. you know, and they add flung to the title. Um, but uh, I wanted to, uh, one of, there's a question uh, only Paul asked in the chat about um, what, uh, why would it be scorched? And also what, what you asked that question for, oh no, sorry, it was beef chicken, but uh, only Paul asked what the material was made of and, uh, and why it was made that way. And I think it's a good point. Like I, um, because I'm a, uh, the right kind of pedant, I hope, the right kind of pedantic people, I'll hear people talk. In fact, I think Stephen Fry even said on QI something about uh, this material being made out of um, paper mache or maybe his uh, video about printing history. And it's, you know, it's not paper mache and it never was paper mache. It was always made from sheets and paper mache is technically, I think is chopped up, right? It's actually literally mashed. Um, and, uh, but the early flying was made in a lot of different techniques, you know, in plasters, and then the process of making it in this, there was, um, I mean, it could be cast, and it was this whole ordeal, I think. And then in, I think it was 1830s-ish, seems to be the time, maybe it was first patented, that there was a paper process, but it was very complicated. And across the 1800s, you have every shop develop its own formula, it's glue and paste, and some icky stuff, and it can actually affect the type, and it's, you know, but it works, it's good enough. And it gets people to the point where they can cast these, you know, hemispherical plates for newspaper printing. But what we have, and I think everything that I know that survives, I've never seen an example of the earlier flongs. I think it was so fragile or, you know, utterly destroyed is this wood pulp kind, the dry flong where they, uh, a company, I think it was first in Germany is what I can tell from some of the trade magazines at the time. 
uh, in like the late 1890s, maybe created a process for dry flong, and then Americans developed their own. And, and the dry flong, <laughs> the wood, or was it the dry flong, wood flong, uh, the box you have, those dry are wood one of flong. the early ones. The, what's it, sorry? Dry wood flong. Dry uh, but wood I also yeah, so have it, a dry um, stereo flong. Um, Oh, but I, oh, I can talk about that in a second. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So I'll, I want to show more material. But so the it looks like uh, from everything I can read, it was just kind of a, um, it's kind of the way they make uh, oriented strand board and particle board things like that, where they're taking the detritus of the wood industry. They took like I think long fibers and things like that, figured out a way to press it into a solid but um, malleable sheet that then you stick it into a either a steam press or a humidor to get it just a little bit um, workable. And then it retains that because, you know, we have, I think between all of us here, we have stuff that dates back. Uh, I think I have one that's a hundred years old, well, almost a hundred years old, but certainly decades and they're okay. perfect. They don't lose their form over time after they were cast. And so that's kind of a neat aspect of flong also is it retains such a, it captures, um, such an incredible impression, even of like halftone dots. And it's also uh, persistent. So anyway, that's the material thing is it was just, it was instead of being a, like a craft thing, like a, a thing you had to produce in your shop, it became an industrial product and that sped up the speed of newspapers and, and its use. So I'm sorry, who, who would like to go? Elizabeth, you wanna go uh, um, show your flaw next? Yeah, of course. Um, I'd love to hear from Paul as well about the uh, composition of flongs. Um, let me show this one because it may or may not be relevant to, to that. Um, and I'd be very curious to know in either way. Um, so this is, uh, let me again change the background. Uh, this is a flong for a printer's boxing night from 1935 ooh, ooh, in London, just great. around the corner from Senate House. And it lists all the, the printers, printers and affiliated industry. Here they, here they are. Um, is that coming through clearly? Yeah, if you hold so it you still can... for a second, I think it'll it'll um, focus. If you great. hold it still, yeah. Yeah, okay. there we go. I'm trying. That's um, yeah, so oh, wow. <laughs> That's and, fantastic. Uh, yeah, look, and you can see the ink sort of between. Is that yeah. what I'm seeing? Like mm -hmm. between the club, between the in the you know in the cup. And you're seeing the furniture as well because the phone takes the texture of the furniture and it's oh yeah totally. Solid. This you have oh, the milk yeah, ready yeah. on the back, as That's well as it. a stamp, which makes me wonder if it was produced externally because why would you stamp something if it was internal about oh, oh sorry is that upside down the, the um, um the, so it's building up on the back i think that's a good thing to mention uh, if you want to talk about that or i can show some examples later too yeah um of course of course so it, this is a dry stereo flong i don't know what that is and i don't know how that differs from other flong, kinds of stereo flongs um these strips um effectively add a tiny bit of height to the larger unprinted areas uh, so that the so that the surface that is cast from and then the resulting surface it's printed from uh, is much more even. So if you look at the front, you can see that. So these are the areas where you have that make ready at the back to to build up the height. Um, but yes, I've been told that uh, printers uh, obviously had very strong arms. Lead is used in type. <laughs> there was a lot of lead shifting. Uh, and so printers boxing competitions are another thing we have lost from print culture um, in the in the shift to digital. I know very little about that. It's just been an um, anecdote from somebody who remembers some stories, but I'd love to know more about that. Maybe not a boxing party, but it would be uh, it would be interesting to know if there was if there were more of these. Um, so I don't know why this was produced. It's not commemorative. There's um, at the bottom, there's a bit of discoloration. It looks like cello tape or uh, some sort of adhesive was there. So it was used, it's bindi, um, it's ripped, it's torn. So somebody kept this for a reason, but it wasn't for the same reason that they would have kept a commemoration of the Man on the Moon or Nixon or other things. Um, but yeah, this is in High Holborn, February 12th, 1935. Um, the building's no longer there. But I, yeah, I'd love to know what the different kinds of stereo flongs were and how they were made. Uh, Paul, have you, in your experiments, have you come across um, dry stereo flongs versus other kinds of stereo flongs and anything about how they were composed. Yes, I think in the in the 20th century, there was a, there was a, a movement from wet flongs to dry flongs. Uh, and um, the, uh, the dry flongs were produced by a sort of plasticized method. Uh, and it meant that basically they could be put, uh, uh, molded to the shape of the, the form of type and blocks um, with just pressure without having to be damped. 
Um, and there, there are a number mm. of books about um, printing from the 20th century which describe this um, dry flong process. Um, and then they also describe the wet flong process as being the older process which is now going out. So mm. and you can see how the, the two kind of um, uh, one developed into the other. Stereotyping and lectotyping, that, that's probably the same book I've got here. But mine is an point. earlier edition, but yeah, yes, it's probably... <laughs> oh yeah, probably the, the dry the flong... Book. The dry flung chapter. I'm sorry, the chapter on dry flung. Um, yeah, this is it's wonderful. I mean, it's one. It's a uh, great to find these old trade books, which cost nothing to obtain, or they're on Google if they're out of copyright, and you can just get it from the the uh, horse's mouth about what they were doing. But in the oh, very yeah. early days, sorry, I was just going to say that in the very early days, before, with wet flung, um, and you said quite rightly that um, flung wasn't papier mâché. But there is an account as early as 1705 in a German encyclopedia of making a flong. So it dates back to at least the 18th century, the early 18th century, um, which does use um, papier mache. It does describe oh, really? um, oh. um, mashing up the paper and, and applying it to the form and allowing it to dry with, I think, a bit of um, plaster in, incorporated with the paper and, and making the flong that way. How effective it would have been, I don't know, but it, it is described. Um, and there is, of course, a very early flong depicted in, in this very peculiar book, The um, New History of Stereotyping by Kubler. Oh, yes. um, and he shows what he says is the first stereotype matrix made with a metal cut, depicting a coronation of the Virgin, which he, he um, uh, dates to the 15th century. And um, probably th this really is a flong, but it was probably not. Where is that? Sorry? Where is it? Where is the, ad the object? Uh, the object, it, well, it, it, it does survive, and I'm afraid I can't remember offhand okay. where it is. I think it's in an American institution. <laughs> I'm sorry. Really? I, I do know. I can find out, but I, I, I can't remember off the top of my head where it is now. Um, oh, but, of course, it's a lot later than 1500. Um, um, it's said, said to be here, 15th century, and it was probably used for casting a panel for um, decoration, perhaps for a, for a cabinet or something like that, rather than for something to print from. Um, but it is a paper paper matrix for printing and um, for um, casting this particular image. Um, and it's, it's probably 17th century, but it's, it certainly shows that this sort of thing did exist before the 19th century when it became a, a practical um, mechanical way of producing copies of forms. Yeah, there's definitely a trade unionism issue or guild issue too, is uh, the, uh, there's an account, well, I'm trying to what source from like the 1700s, there was a Scott who invented a, a process, mm -hmm. I think it was a plaster process, and his printers uh, sabotaged it because they thought it would, there's this idea that um, the same thing happened with the you know, advent of uh, mechanized typesetting as well, or, or machine driven typesetting, that it would reduce the amount of work. And of course, as we all know, it increased the amount of work because the more work you could put through, the cheaper it was and people would buy more of it, which would make it more mass market. But in every case, the printers are like, no, 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 we don't want an automation process because that will lead to redundancy. And it was like, well, actually, if only you knew, and you would have been able to uh, hire more. Uh, um, I wanted to ask Paul a question yeah. about the different materials. And Paul, do you have a sense of, so in the shift from sort of wet to dry and the different ways in which people were making flong, did that affect the temperature that the flong could withstand when it was being used as a matrix? That's a very good question. I don't really know the answer, but I, but I suspect it didn't make much difference, no. I think you had to still be very careful to get the metal, um, at a usable temperature. Um, I, I don't, I, I've never seen anything which suggested that you had more leeway with the dry version. I think it still had, was a question of getting the temperature of the metal right. And also, um, if the temperature of the metal was wrong, not only would the flong itself not stand up, but um, uh, you would get a better casting. If it, if, uh, sorry, if it was right, you would get a better casting. If the, if the temperature of the metal was wrong, that the um, sharpness of the casting would be reduced. Um, and I don't think there was any practical difference in that respect between the wet and dry flongs. Uh, Sarah, would you like to share? You have a very special flong, I know. That you, I have uh, a I have a weird flong. flong. So I I um, I'm just going to hold it up, and then I'm going to share my screen to show you photos, so you can see it more clearly. Because it's it's one second. It's big. Oh my gosh! Wow. That's what the Washington Post looked like in those Am days, I... or, or no, Dallas. I can't remember which. Wait, thing. I have to. Oh, sorry. Plug myself back was... in, but what? But what Glenn was saying, like, that, so that's the front page of a newspaper. It's 
huge. It's huge. Like I like the Washington Post is not that big now. Um, share screen. Here we go. So it's the. Wait, what I want? Wait one second. Zoom this over. Open it up. All right, you guys seeing the screen? I can't even see your faces now. I don't know what's happening. Oh, yeah. Um. So it's a. Clear. It's the front page of Nixon's resignation, 72. It's got the final edition up there. And the thing about it is it's so, it's so crisp. It's so crisp. So that's the front. That's the back, because I always like the backs of mm -hmm. things. Um, that's, <laughs> that's the Nixon's hugging. But it's amazing to me that the flung is able to capture that detail of the photograph, right? Can you zoom in on that, please? On, on the, the on the photo. On the photo. Yep. Is that is that good, Elizabeth? You can yeah, sort of see. So extraordinary that you're thinking these dots. I mean, it did answer right? the question for me as a I came into printing when in the phototype era, and I had no idea how they did half toning, how they captured half toning before yeah, phototype. So and you think. still look at that, and you're thinking, how did they get a it could hold that kind of dot. Right? It's amazing. I mean, look at the, the details of his ear. <laughs> look, it's Richard Dixon's ear, <laughs> which, you know, I didn't know that I really wanted to look at in, in close, but I guess I did. Um, it, can you see the, the individual dots? Can you see the individual? Yes, like in here, right? Can you see the sort of... Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. It's really hard to sort of like see if you're seeing, that's as sort of as zoomed in as I can get yes. on that one. It'd be amazing to know what resolution flunks could capture. Yes. Because that is incredible. When that I was is. a kid, 85 lines per inch was newspaper resolution. Um, and again, didn't know why. And that, of course, is much higher now because they also yeah. put uh, digital um, You know what, Elizabeth, I can send you, you I could just send you the photographs that I took of it, which will be much crisper. And then you can sort of like dig in a little bit further. Um, but you can just see, like, this is part of what I mean when I think, like, this has never been, this has never been used. It's so clean. It's right. so, look how crisp it is. Um, and the bite is insane, which is what you want. And you and can then tell, you can get, I mean, this is something, someone saved this. I mean, obviously, because Nixon, so there's a reason for the people, well, they may have made a bunch of them, because yeah, you saw how quickly the they could make them in that video. They could have turned around 50 of them if they wanted to in, in 10 minutes. Yes. So that, I mean, so when I bought it from someone on eBay um, and sh she reported that she got it from somebody who worked at the Washington Post and she didn't know who, and she didn't know what, you know, level mm -hmm. of person. Um, but it totally makes sense to me that people at the, at the Post in particular, um, cause they were so central to making this resignation happen. Um, would have printed off maybe a bunch of these, which then raises other questions of like, are there other, mm -hmm. like if I started putting out inquiries around Washington, DC, would other people be like, oh yeah, we have one of those commemorative flongs. It's, I mean, it's I just, it's huge and super stiff and never used and I love it. And I don't know what to do with it, but that's my flong. Um, somebody has just it. said yes. on YouTube, there might be asbestos in it, maybe a percentage. <gasps> of Interesting. Did. You impossible know, so, because nobody cared about asbestos at that point. So I'm like, sure it's so, hmm. You know, that's a really good, because one of the things I don't understand is the tech, I can't convey that on the screen, but when we talk yeah. about sort of like paper and, and wood flung and all that, I'm like, this, it feels, to me, I would say it feels plasticky. Yeah, yeah. Which plastic would melt, but, there, but there's, there's something about this that doesn't feel yeah. like it's just straight up paper don't you know i guess if i never break it i'll be okay with yes and it looks but... creamier and crisper than the dry wood flong which it's... echoes when you tap it it's very very hard yeah and this mm. is this cream creamy is exactly right and, and crisp it's really it's, it's kind of fun to stroke which i try not to which i try not thank to, you Henri paul that's a slightly terrifying observation the, i know i've got to think about well i mean you know asbestos is only dangerous when it's uh aerosolized really right when it's you're breathing mm. it and it's moved around mm. but it's still i mean i should send mm. a sample of a flong to get analyzed and find out things i don't want to know um i'd also point out i think it was really common to make commemorative flongs for particular purposes i found an article in the new york times from 
last year, I think it was, which is the first time you get a byline on the cover of New York Times as a reporter, you see, yeah, they, or a photographer, they make, uh, they send you a plate and that makes sense in the offset days because the plates are very lightweight and so forth. But uh, they used to do something else earlier. They wouldn't send you the metal. It's possible mm -hmm. they sent flongs to reporters. And uh, because I've become known as the flong guy on the internet, you search for flong, you find me. Uh, I get email from people who are like, oh, my grandmother was a proofreader or uh, spell his mother. Oh, sorry. His mother was a proofreader and he had framed flongs all over the house and she'd passed away uh, she was proofreading in the 1930s to 50s for a major paper maybe the washington post i've forgotten which and um they had flongs in the house and he inherited them and so he had uh it must be in his 70s or 80s he had a house uh with like eight or nine front page major events you know we invade japan or whatever flongs and he's like i don't know what to do with them and uh, i try to put him in touch with uh some museum collections because they're both valueless and incredibly valuable like they don't have an inherent meaning except to people like us so they're not no one's going to pay fifty thousand dollars for it but it's also it'd be a tragedy if it was lost right that's the, <laughs> the issue of this kind of stuff this ephemera weird ephemera like it's not even an original but it is an original that's kind of the fun part isn't it that's an interesting question original or not original when you're talking about imagery um, yeah and how do you determine whether something is printed from a flung or from the original, um, or from the original printing surface, mm -hmm. uh, or does that matter? And how does that help or quantify things? Uh, no, it's really, really interesting stuff. Um, I've just seen that I've Derek seen. has asked. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. oh, sorry? No, no, go ahead. Uh, Eric Dunham has asked: Are there counterfeit flungs out there? And if so I want to know who because we want to mm -hmm. know how they made them, right, Paul? <laughs> and why? Yeah. Right. Well, yes, um, if they then, don't have, have a value, then you wonder why anyone would counterfeit them. But uh, I mean, uh, right, they do have a value, as you say, but it's a, it's a very, fairly minimal value. They're not exactly collector's items. So why would anyone forge them? But it's possible. Quite, and it, then you could sure. do it. Yeah. You could, you could do. I mean, so I, I just happened to be reading for different purposes Nick Wilding's um, uncovery of the Galileo. Um, the Sidereus Notius forgeries, which is super interesting. And there's a way in which I'm thinking about photopolymer plates as a kind of flaw, mm -hmm. maybe, but not quite. Um, but you could do, please, oh, now I'm like, maybe I should not say this publicly. If you could forge forge flong you could recreate a sort of like historical evidence of something that we don't have. And so much of the stuff that you print with flong is ephemeral that it wouldn't be surprising maybe if it didn't oh. survive. You could do, you know, what that, oh, that wouldn't have worked because the, the Mormon document was sort of pre-flong. He should have, he should have forged not the oath keepers. You guys know what I'm talking about? The, the yeah, apprentice's yeah. oath or whatever it's called. He should have done flong for it. <laughs> All right, so don't do that. But I think, but, but oh, there, there's sort of interesting playful things you could do. Can I ask a question, uh, um, which is about uh, some, some of the flongs that I've seen are, are, are small. Or, uh, Glenn, you mentioned earlier flongs of, of uh, uh, syndicated cartoons or advertisements and stuff, which is sort of page fragments. How, how does a flong work that isn't the full thing? How do you insert that into a larger oh. um, page? This, this troubled me for a long time. And then I realized I've been researching a, a, a video that this is help for as well too, because I keep talking through Flong uh, for the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum about the history of syndication with uh, like the technology of syndication uh, because they have a massive collection in Ohio State of um, like millions of reproductions of comics and they have very little of the method by which comics were produced. And I started accidentally collecting here. I'm gonna show, this is actually a great time. I'll show a few things. Um, but so, so the issue is it's a five generation process. A cartoonist draws a comic. It's made into a zinc plate photographically through, you know, it's, it's captured on photosensitive uh, material onto zinc, it's etched. The zinc is then used to create flongs the, in the thousands. The flongs were sent to newspapers. The newspapers would cast these small pieces of flong on thinly backed metal, and I'll show it to you. They would lay it out in their newspaper page then they would make a flong from the newspaper page, then they would make a stereo from that, and then they would print it. So it's cartoonist, etched plate, 
flong stereo flong stereo paper and you're thinking how did that work but that's then it explains something which is if you look um there's the bende dots which are everyone's very familiar with of uh from that era that kind of uh preset kinds of uh, patterns that you could lay down for uh, shading and dots and lines and things. And they were all at a certain resolution and, but also the line structure. So I think part of the contention I have is that comics obviously had to reflect the medium of reproduction and, and dissemination. So when you look at the lines used in older comics, it has to be because they had standards because with a like five generation process, if they use very thin lines or very thin tints, there's no way it would have survived all those steps. So let me uh, mm. I'll share. <clears throat> The overhead camera here. This is one of my most cherished possessions. I would have to say is uh, oh, oops, that's the wrong. Sorry, it's the wrong. I have multiple screens going. We have very sophisticated. Just as an aside, you know who we need to get really excited about flong is some conservator somewhere, right? We have we have a, a range of us oh, who are yeah. like the scholars, the printers, the print historians, but like somebody who does conservation, I think really we could benefit from that. I think before we get started um, on that, there is a comment in the in the YouTube oh, yeah. uh, session. And my screen has just gone a bit funny. Um, come back, YouTube. Absolutely jaw-dropping. Eric Denham says there's an Apollo 11 flong on eBay for $12,000, which could be oh, incentive to counterfeit. No, uh, right. So it looks like Glenn is creating the market for flongs. Um, and then accidental. This is, it's like Bitcoin. I'm, I'm creating a market for uh, something that doesn't mean anything to except to a few people. I will say there was a couple of years ago at the New York Antiquarian Book Fair, um, Deborah Coltham, Coltham's Coltham, I'm remembering her name right, uh, was selling a uh, World War One era front page flong that was gorgeous. I it it that. looked like it had been used. Do you remember that? Also? It's like, I don't know, I, I I don't know where it ended up. Yeah. I don't but either. by the time I saw it, which was earlier at the fair, it had already, <laughs> it had already been yeah. snatched. Deborah Absolutely. always has the most incredible things. Yeah. As well. Yeah. So this is yeah. very exciting uh, stuff to me and many us. It's a, a four color separation uh, syndication uh, of a peanut Sunday strip. So what you're looking at in the main screen is the black or key plate. And, um, you know, again, it's, oops, you can see that. There we go. So incredible, Sarah was saying incredible bite. Like, look how deep that is impressed. Uh, and it's also fun to look at it on the back sometimes too, just to see how. And so these obviously weren't used because there's no make ready on the back. It wasn't built up. So these are clean. I bought them from Sweden. Go figure why the English version was in Sweden. And it's got some really hilarious, weird little printing marks on the side, maybe for registration. I don't know what. Um, it's great looking stuff. And uh, it's 19. Can you move it so back there's... to the printer's mark? It was a bit blurry. Oh, sorry. Let me see if I can. With this stuff on the side. right spot there we go Sorry, maybe it's not it's a bunch of ends is the funny part it's just like a bunch of uh it's like a bunch of ends or marks so i don't know if those are registration but so let's see it could just be from the furniture could it well it hasn't been it's possible it's just very regular it looks drawn almost so maybe it was good. yeah so then here's the red plate and you can see or the cyan and actually they're marked they're marked cyan or sorry they're marked red yellow uh, blue and key in black, not CMYK, because that seems to be a convention for the for newspapers that they use that. Um, so the red plate, and then and they actually printed the word red in there. It's actually part of the marks. They would have had to remove that. It was sort of for guidance. They would have had to fill that in while making the flongs or making the exteriors from these, and then mm. yellow and blue. And it's just kind of fun to see this set of. This is how you know they made. A comic in those days and this is 1970 when i say 77 uh so it's relatively late and uh, i bought a copy of that strip i found this is actually a printed copy from um the uh, san francisco chronicle which their printing is terrible their printers should be fired retroactively but it's just awful awful printing um <laughs> But late stage uh, uh, letterpress printing in newspapers in America was not that exciting. Um, but so uh, I, there's a better copy. What's funny is uh, in the Billy Ireland collection, they looked through and they had a copy from a different newspaper that they showed me a scan of that's printed beautifully, like almost as if it was printed in a, in a, a book collection. Um, and I'll show you the other most cherished thing I have in my collection here, which well, somebody, some of these things will be donated somewhere, but this is, um, these are Doonesbury flongs. 
that uh, so I'm trying to land them up here. Oh, I gotta go for there. Um, this is a sheet of Doonesbury flong from uh, May 1973. And the extraordinary thing about it is that, and you can see the top, I don't know if you can read it, but it says Hartford Current. So these were going to go into mm. press. You look at the back, there's make ready on them. And uh, these never ran. Uh, of these, set, it's six daily strips. And uh, only a few of them ran in their exact form because John Ehrlichman resigned the week these were supposed to run and they had to rush out a bunch of different strips. And that was a time, if those of you are comics fans, that Gary Trudeau said, I'm no longer going to be working five to six weeks in advance. I'm going to be sending stuff out a week in advance. This was the moment. So two of these strips uh, never ran. Um, I had some email with Mr. Trudeau about the time. It was very interesting. Um, anyway, so this is, I, I love this because of the comic angle, but it's also, it's an uncut sheet. I mean, if you talk about collector's value, this did not cost very much. I think the person who sold it didn't really expect to have a historical value, but it's an uncut sheet of six daily strips and some of them never ran. So it's one of the only things that I own that I would say has unique historic value because of, uh, they don't exist. Like I've talked to the Beinecke uh, Library at Yale that has all of uh, Trudeau's archives. I've talked to Gary Trudeau and uh, it's unclear if these exist in any other form. So if there's no other flong, I mean, he's probably, his originals are probably somewhere. And they're probably in one of his boxes, but he didn't put them aside at the time or care as much about them. So anyway, this is one of the only examples. Because everything else, you know, the peanut flong, uh, peanuts was uh, being syndicated to, you know, I don't know, 2000 newspapers in 1970. So there's thousands of these and some of them may survive. Anyway, so that, uh, but that, I don't know if that helps answer the question about the, um, about the, uh, the casting part and if i the i showed earlier on the slide paul aiken had that single unit casting thing and so i'm assuming in newspapers they also had small casting units so they'd take a flong like this they would cast it flat and then pull it out oh and i was going to show uh it's right here so one second uh so here's a uh <laughs> dagwood and blondie which is still running after all these years uh, we've just gotten a, a comment story. That uh, when I was when Johan Dezoto was delivering newspapers to the subscribers in the early 1960s, lovely to see you here, by the way, Johan. Uh, I received the stack of newspapers wrapped in flongs, but didn't oh realize about at the time. Oh, what did you do with them? Did you just rip them off and throw them away? Oh. Did you know? Let's give him a minute to answer. But it makes sense I mean, the use of, of flongs within the trade. Yeah, they were, I mean, they were not valuable, so why not? It totally does. And it's like, um, it's reminding me of, you know, it's like an early print historian that so many of us here on this call are, are um, it's exactly what you do with printer's waste, right? Like you have, you have binder's waste, you have other stuff, and you're like, well, I don't know what else to do, but it's as useful as an object of paper or parchment. I mean, stick it inside the binding. Totally makes sense that you would wrap the stack of newspapers in it, right? Like reuse what yeah. you can reuse. Absolutely. Uh so this is actually an interesting case. I actually have three things. I can't put them all on screen at once. And one is very heavy. This is, you can see the thickness, I think maybe of uh, this uh, Blondie plate, which mm. is from, uh, oh, I think this is the 1960s, if I remember right. Here's a Doonesbury, which they actually even cut some of the metal out, maybe to reduce the size. I, I'm not clear why. And it's much thinner. It's about half as thin. It's from the 1970s. And then this is a great thing. It's a Joe Palooka comic strip, this boxing comic strip, thinking about boxing from the 1940s during the war. And the crazy part is it's type high. They actually, it's cast to go on press. And it's possible this came from a press that was still printing with, um, what do they call those country presses or things like that, where they were not using a, a circular press and so they would cast it to full height and actually be printing without flong i don't know or or they made flong in a different ma manner but it's wild to me because everybody else would have a they'd have a base you know you'd mount this on a oops you mount this on a base to show um uh to get to type high to cast paul have you come across instructions it. for that for casting flongs type high or reasons why that would be a good I, use of time and metal Yes, I haven't, although I, it does make sense to do that. Um, if you are going to print from what you cast directly from, from, the, uh, from the flong, and you're going to take that to the press and lay it on the flatbed press rather than on the rotary press, it does make sense to cast type height. 
um, if you're going to use it to, uh, in part of a form that's made up also with type. Um, but I imagine it's probably quite a simple process. You probably just have to use a casting box that is of the right size, mm -hmm. that is designed for casting at that depth. Usually mm -hmm. casting boxes are designed to cast you a thin plate, but it wouldn't be terribly difficult to make the casting box either adjustable or to have a different casting box that was the right size for casting to type height. It's just such yeah. a thick block of metal. Would it not take a bit longer to cool? Um, it would take a bit longer to cool, yes. It would take a little bit longer, although it, not a great, I mean, it wouldn't make a great deal of difference. Uh, and the, probably the expectation would be that it would be melted down again afterwards, just as most, yeah. of, most of the um, stereotypes were. So it wasn't considered, I'm sure it wasn't considered a waste of metal. Yeah, for reference, this is reusable. six pounds or what is that, nearly three <laughs> kilograms, uh, this thing. And so just from a handling standpoint, I mean, I know a, a, a newspaper, you, you would see the photos of guys handling like a newspaper form and they're they're holding it like this and you're thinking you're holding 150 pounds of metal but so it's a good example just to hold i have moved a fair amount of metal but usually not a big block like this and it's just it's astonishing they would have kept, they would have cast it but that's why they went sense. to printers boxing matches <laughs> uh well, we're sort of nearing the end of our hour and um we'll definitely i'm sure we'll do this again i have several other people who were uh who said, uh, hey, am I too late to sign up? And I said, I think we have enough for this first outing. Um, but does anyone else have other flong or questions or um, stories? Have we answered all the questions? Yes, the... may I just show the one I've made? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, of course. Yes. Oh, and you were going to show the uh, scorched one. I'm sorry. Uh, well, no, it's not the scorched one. That's the one I made oh. and didn't work, but I did make one oh. that worked. So <laughs> I, will, I will try and... Um, I will try and use my camera to show you what I did. I, I wanted to create a, a flong for the... Um, Printing Historical Society's uh, keepsake. You're going to see a bit of my bedroom here, I'm afraid, which isn't intended. Uh, uh, but what I've got here is a little form I made for one of the uh, pages in that keepsake. And I hope you can see it at least well enough. Uh, the focus isn't very good, I'm sorry. Um, you can see it at least well enough that um, it's, a, it's a single page form with type, a block, and the uh, furniture has been built up to be the level of type height around the edge of the form so that that gives you the um that gives you um the edge of the flong when you cast it and what i did with that was i made a flong in the way that was described in the victorian handbook that um that glenn mentioned uh using the paste that they describe which is quite a complicated recipe and i couldn't make it work uh and i tried with a brush i tried banging it with a flong brush um, which I made myself from an old scrubbing brush. Um, and it worked in principle, but it, I couldn't actually cast from it. I just couldn't get a decent cast. Um, so what I then did was I appealed for help. And I was uh, helped by a, a Frenchman, Frederick Tachot, who told me that uh, he'd been making flongs in the basic way that he, he thought it had been done in the early days, which was to use simply flour, not, not any uh, complex uh, paste. <laughs> And what he did was um, he instructed me to use um, five sheets of thin um, trace, uh, sorry, um, tissue paper and to coat them well in a flour water mix and then use two sheets of thin blotting paper the same way, coated in uh, this mix, and then one sheet of thick blotting paper and to place that on top of the um, form and then to put it in a press with some damp felt in between. So it was rather like the later... So we didn't use the brush, even though we were trying to reproduce this 19th century method. And I tried several that I did get in the end, a good one. And this is the good flong that I got. I'll see if I can get it an angle so you can see that. Oh, that's mm. great. I'd love to see a flong along. If you do this again, can you please film it? <laughs> Ooh, yes, I, 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 did, I did take some photographs as I went along. And unfortunately, I haven't got access to them at the moment. But uh, mm. um, so I'm, I'm showing you the... the the things rather than what we um, actually yeah. did. No, no, that's fantastic. Sorry, that's... Uh, yeah, this and... is amazing. Yeah, no, I had seen that in the cage. I had completely forgotten about that. That's fantastic. And I put it into a casting box, which I made myself with just with pieces of metal. So, so mm -hmm. two two large flat pieces of metal on the outside, and some smaller thin pieces of metal to make the um, the edges, the sides of the um, the box. And then you can see it's got a piece of brown paper pasted on there, which is the tongue which helps you to pour the metal in. And happily, this one worked perfectly, more or less perfectly. And I've managed to produce 
it's a bit heavier. The um, stereotype plate, which is here, and you can see that. That way a bit. Oh, yeah. So, beef chicken industry Great. says the casting boxes were water cooled. Uh, yes. Oh. Um, was with Holly. Lovely to see you too here. Um, Certainly the later ones were, yeah. Yes, in the 20th century they were water cooled, oh. and pro probably in the later 19th century as well. Um, mm -hmm. not, not so in the early ones, and of course mine wasn't, but um, it, it would help to have them water cooled simply because it would speed up the process. Yeah. You have to let it that cool. Be, of course. Yeah, to, our, to beef chicken there, that would be the, um, like the ones that I showed uh, from the, uh, like the New York Times operations, and some of those, those would have, that's what I assume you're talking about, those more industrial scale ones, as opposed to the smaller size of hand operated or not artisanal, but you know what I mean, the, the ones that uh, Paul was just talking about, because it seemed like there were a lot of piping around there, both to bring the lead in and also to cool them almost mm -hmm. instantly so they came out as solid blocks. Yes, absolutely. Um, but what I was trying to do was to reproduce the sort of earliest, most primitive right. form, um, which was much less industrial. Uh, and then finally, I can show you, I'll put this back. And I'll show you the print that was taken off the flom, which was oh. was not completely perfect, but it wasn't bad. Um, so there is there is the page. Oh, that looks <laughs> and it's a, pretty it's a page fabulous, though. Describing stereotyping, it's not bad, and the image That's was great. just just one that I happen to have that was the right size. There's no relevance to the to the to the fact that it's a polar bear coming over. You did, a, you did a phoenix <laughs> for the future. Well, yes, it's a, it's kind of a polar bear phoenix. Um, so all of that was was printed from the um, from the block I cast. So because it's very unusual to have, you see the bottom of my face. Because it's very unusual to only have to have all four things together: the form, the flong, the stereotype, and the print. I very carefully measured them all to see how different they were in size, and I was slightly surprised to find they didn't vary much. In fact, mm -hmm. the only difference I could really find um, was between the, the stereotype plate uh, and the flong itself. So the stereotype plate shrunk by about 1% from the flong. But the flong was, I measured it, it, it seemed to be exactly the same size as the form. So that was the moment at which the mm -hmm. shrinkage happened. And it was only shrinkage of 1% when, when the stereotype was cast. So that's my story. That's fantastic. Yeah, I think you may be, uh, you know, I've asked around a lot. <laughs> I've pestered some people and uh, I don't know anybody else who's actually successfully uh, done this. And um, I know people who are pretty crafty about wanting to recreate, you know, some processes, but nobody, you know, this is, I always quote, quote the Annie Proulx line from Shipping News, where there's a bit about writing a story about an oil mm -hmm. tanker. It's something like, no one puts a picture of an oil tanker up on the wall. And I always mm -hmm. come back to that. I'm like, no, I want my flying on the wall. It's kind of, you know, <laughs> it's this weird industrial process, but so people will recreate everything else, but there's no need for it. Mm -hmm. And so people, but I think it's a great part, you know, just like you want to know how did Gutenberg print, how did Benjamin Franklin print, how did Stanhope print, um, how did they make the transition to, you know, uh, faster presses in the 19th century. I would love to, I don't know, I'd love to know more about each of those transitions because nobody cared enough to record enough most of the time in the historical event. So seeing these recreations are incredible because it's so ingenious. And then it was turned into this wonderful mass industrial process that created, you know, the ability to produce cheap newspapers among other things. So anyway, mm -hmm. it's very exciting to see. And you, you, it's always fun if you're the first person to successfully do something in a modern era and you may have that prize right now. <laughs> well, Unless, I have to I've say, asked her, yeah. Yeah, Frederick uh, Tasho, who get, told me how to do it, has done it himself before in oh, France. So I'm certainly not the first person to have done it successfully. All right, well, for, among but, the yeah. first people, it's, I mean, there yeah. are still some of the machinery out there. I know there's people who have um, some, you know, there's, if you pull out the, the book we were looking at earlier, the. Um, stereotyping and uh, uh, stereotyping electrotyping book it oh. describes the you know 
17 different machines that are used to make stereos like forget the flong part yeah it's got it's just picture after picture it's like then there's the trimmer then there's the planer then there's the saw then there, and you're like all of these machines so that i do know that some of these machines exist like in warehouses in the midwest in america and elsewhere because someone did save them from some process and put them aside but they haven't been in use and um so even some of the tweakies people i know they're all the people who are i think most engaged in trying to recover that period are working on casting and ensuring that there's people trained uh, like Greg Walters has an amazing casting operation with some super caster or not super casters, but some of uh, the large pivotal casters that don't exist anywhere else. And he's teaching people to cast mm. um, that kind of thing is really critical if you want to preserve like both active letterpress and so forth. But anyway, it's just wonderful to see the recreation work because I think it's just as important to understand the period as, as I think we all do because we're all <laughs> excitingly looking at all this stuff. So. <laughs> One thing and plug very quickly. Um, Paul is the incredibly, incredibly brilliant editor of the Journal of the Printing Historical Society. Um, it is very much worth subscribing to that. It's um, it's incredibly good value for what it is. It's not that much money. You get um, you get the annual journal. You get um, publications that the Printing Historical Society sponsors. It is excellent scholarship because Paul vets every single word of it and every stop press change. Mm -hmm. um, and it all is about printing processes. And it's not available online. It is. Um, hard copy only because it is about the history of printing. And there is, if you're interested in writing up something about flongs, there is actually a prize that the PHS offers um, for, for new scholars to find as anybody at any career stage who's been working on the history of printing techniques for uh, seven years or less. Uh, so whether you're a teenager or you're um, a world leading scholar, but you just you started to move into this area a few years ago. Um, or you're a non-academic or you're a practitioner or a printer or an engineer who likes to play with old print toys. There is very much an audience for this kind of thing. And the prize has uh, five comes with 500 pounds membership and publication with Paul's wonderful copy edits, which improve, have improved every article I have ever run past him. Uh, so please do consider thinking about the Printing Historical Society if you're interested in this kind of thing. Well, yeah. I'll just add, oh, well, go ahead, Paul, then I'll try. Oh, I was just going to add, and Paul, if you ever, so as one of the co-editors of the papers of the Bibliographical Society of America, um, this falls totally in the remit of sort of bibliographical studies that we're interested in. Um, so anyone who's interested in publishing in a journal, and especially if somebody's the editor of a different journal, and maybe he doesn't want to publish his own stuff in his own journal, <laughs> get in touch with, um, with PBSA. We are actively looking to sort of get more of this um, into the records that more people can learn from from this in the future. Thank you. Uh, well, I'd just like to thank you all for joining me on this random thing that Elizabeth suggested. I'm so pleased to have been able to make actually work. It's the first time I've done a streaming live event. So congratulations that we, that we all pulled it off. So uh, thank you to the audience watching and people watching this later after uh, after it airs and thank you to Paul, Sarah, Dennis and Elizabeth and um, I think we'll do this again because I say I have other volunteers who have flog and we'll uh, we'll roll this out again and we can do some routine I love the showing and uh, showing and telling aspect is, is just a hoot um, I've got piles of things I didn't pull out I've got even more secrets in my collection here so we'll we'll share those but thank you all for coming thanks for all being on the on the zoom and thank you everyone for watching <laughs>